As a Dutchman, I'm uh, very pleased that, uh, to see this uh, petal design and that the first sign of life will be greeted with flowers in, the, um, <laughs> in space. So with that, I would like to uh, invite all the speakers of this morning to join me at stage. And the, I will then ask one introductory question to each and every one of them. And I also have a few, we have selected a few questions from, uh, from the audience. Uh, there's still a chance to, uh, to get more questions um, to people here, and we will take them as they come. If we disrupted the order. I think we've completely shuffled the order. OK, so we, um, we don't have infinite time. Uh, we, we are aiming for quarter of 12, but absolutely no later than, than 1 o'clock. So I will, have, um, I will have one leading question that I would like everybody, and we'll just go from the left to the right, uh, to, uh, to answer. Uh, but this question you can spend 15 minutes easily per person on answering them, but I don't allow you to do that. So please have a very brief, um, brief answer. So each of you represents a unique approach to the study of the planet and some of the major challenges it faces. What do you see as the next big breakthrough in your area? That's the first question. And the second question is, what are the greatest obstacles that you face? Sarah. Uh, okay, I'll be brief since you just heard my talk. I'll say that on the good news side, we have decades of study of Earth and solar system planets to work with. So our challenges remain technological, like the ones that I described. I think, um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think that the uh, going back to basics and fundamental research on climate is going to reveal some very interesting and startling aspects of our climate system, very likely involving water as a very important uh, substance in the climate. I think the biggest challenge in my field is linking processes that happen at the scale of a microbe or an individual gene to the planetary scale processes, and then tying that to these long time evolution processes that then impact the ability of people like Sarah to look for biosignatures. So really tying everything across the scales. So economists don't innovate. Um, you guys, <laughs> you guys innovate. Um, but uh, so let me just just put a thought in your head. Just imagine imagine a world where batteries were free. I think the world would be very different. Um, so reducing the cost of batteries would have profound effects on on climate change. Well, I'll, I'll mention two things. Uh, First, I, I, I will make a forecast that we will see much more use of recycled water for potable purposes in the coming years. In terms of a very difficult problem we face in water, it's finding ways to safely and reliably disinfect water uh, in small villages in uh, impoverished places. Uh, we know how to do that very well at large scale with urban infrastructure, but finding a means to do it that's cheap enough and reliable enough that people will adopt it uh, when they're living at a subsistence level is an extremely difficult uh, problem in engineering and economics. One of the most frustrating and challenging things about landscapes is that they're right in front of us. We can walk all over our data set, and yet they change so slowly that it's very difficult to measure. And half of the interesting stuff that happens fast happens when we're not looking, like landslides. And so I think that there uh, will be continued progress, which has been moving very rapidly recently in our ability to measure rates like tenths of a millimeter per year of erosion rates averaged over long periods of time, and also our ability to instrument landscapes and transmit that data in real time so that we can have eyes in all places. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few more general questions for each of you, but I'll leave them to the end. And there's also a few questions that we have been receiving from, uh, from the audience and that we've been uh, selecting. Um, and they are targeted to individual people. And the first question is for you, Kerry. Um, can you compare the greenhouse gas gases in terms of volume uh, and also the effects that they have uh, caused by volcanoes to those produced by humans? Um, yes, the current um, 
and sort of geologically averaged emissions of greenhouse gases, most of which are CO2 from volcanoes, is of order 1% today of human emissions of carbon dioxide. So would you say that's negligible or that's... Uh, it's, it's, not, um, it's not important on the time scales that we're concerned about, hundreds of thousands of years. But those emissions are very, very important on geological time scales and uh, on time scales of many, many millions of years and beyond. That's the major source of carbon dioxide for the atmosphere. And then there are many sinks, most of which today are biological. And the related question for you, Kerry, is, um, of course, in, in several decades ago, we have the DDT in, in Africa, and we managed to put some kind of acceptable level on, on what, you know, on, on, on its use. In a similar vein, um, is there a process or is, is there a way to determine kind of an acceptable or correct temperature for the Earth? I think there's a very definite answer to that question. If one looks at the last 10,000 years of climate history, the Holocene sort of began at the end of the last ice age, it was in the last 7,000 or so years of that that human civilization developed. And human civilization today is very, very finely adapted to that climate. So by definition, that's the optimal climate for us. If it gets appreciably warmer, or appreciably colder, the changes will be very disruptive to civilization. Question for you, John. Chris Knittel mentioned that it was a, about, you know, he talked about a carbon tax and a carbon trade. What about a water tax? Maybe a combined question for you and, and Chris. Uh, so while there is a, a price on water, uh, as opposed to carbon, it does not reflect the true cost, especially you know, given the water infrastructure in many places here in the United States. I think that's a completely fair observation. Uh, water pricing varies quite a bit, and there is some correlation of per capita use with the way water is priced. Uh, I mentioned, for example, uh, very high use in some of the Gulf states. Uh, water is provided essentially free by the government, so there's little incentive to conserve. If you look at Europe, the per capita consumption tends to be lower, the prices tend to be higher. Uh, in terms of capturing the full cost, uh, certainly the pricing of water doesn't do anything to reflect the costs of the kind of environmental disruption that I've shown in some of my slides. That's an externality. And so there is a good deal of study of how one might capture those other costs, uh, but I think I'm going to defer to my friends in economics uh, uh, for the full answer to that. <laughs> well, it's certainly true that in many areas water prices are just worse than gasoline prices and, and things like that. In, in regions in California, for example, the effective water price or the implicit water price is negative. You have water rights that if you don't use them, you lose them. So you might, that, that creates an incentive to just open the spigots and let the water out. Um, before coming to MIT, I, was in, I was, lived in, in California and, and taught at UC Davis. We grow rice in Sacramento. <laughs> I think that, that's, that's a sufficient statistic for telling you that something's wrong. <laughs> Related question to John. Would you change your license plate? <laughs> <laughs> Happy to. No. On the cost issue, and that's, that's going back to, uh, to weather and um, to, to carry, I think. Uh, do we have an estimate of the cost of weather extremes, um, you know, that, that result from climate change? Well, I, my, uh, I'm not an economist, but my information is specific to hurricanes in the United States, where I've worked a lot on that. And um, uh, events like Katrina and Sandy are sort of order $100 billion events to the economy. And uh, when you look at sort of worst case scenarios, you're up into the, you know, a half trillion dollar range. That's just one kind of natural hazard in one country. Chris, you want to? Well, there's, and, and this is one of the issues with, with climate change that I tried to relay is, is that there are lots of models out there. Um, the models are models. There's lots of cost estimates. Many of them disagree. Um, but what I, I like to turn that around, and at least when I'm talking to policymakers, the, the fact that these costs are uncertain in many ways means that we should do more. You know, 
you, you don't know your house is going to catch on fire. You don't know you're going to get in a, in a automobile accident. We have insurance for 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 insuring against those risks. So, um, in, in many ways, you can think of climate change policy as an insurance premium, and 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 I think it's it's well understood that the the benefits far exceed the costs of, of that insurance premium. I have another question for him each of the, uh, the, the speakers. Um, and in your answer, you don't have to restrict yourself to your own field of expertise, but just you know, what you think is the most important uh, thing. <coughs> is there enough public awareness of the areas that you see as being most important? And what could be done to educate the public? And I will start now on the other end of the, the line. Taylor. Well, you know, the, the burden of communication rests in part on, on us as scientists. You can't expect everybody to read scientific literature, of course. And so I think that we can do a better job of not only communicating our results, but also of communicating about events that are relevant to the things we study that happen on a regular basis. So just to borrow an example uh, from a topic that I talked about in, in my own talk, you've heard about a lot of uh, landslides in the news recently. Washington State, Afghanistan, Colorado. I think it would be great if we had someone who was a recognizable face, not just whoever an individual news station decides to choose on a given day, who could be sort of like the local weatherman, who everybody knows and, and can trust and relate to, who could come out and give an explanation of what exactly happened in each of those cases that provides, kind of cuts through uh, the sound bites you hear and gives an explanation of what's happening uh, in terms of the science. So I think we can do a, a better job of, of how we communicate and how we concentrate our efforts. Thank you. John. I think, uh, as well, there, there are things to be discussed. Uh, apart from the issues of water supply that come right to the front when there is a drought, uh, there are also questions about day-to-day -day use that can be addressed. I'll give you uh, uh, one example as, as bottled water. Uh, we have these uh, lovely little bottles here. Uh, these <coughs> bottles contain water, which is basically the same as you're going to get from the MWRA, right? Uh, they come in a plastic bottle that goes to landfill. They charge you a dollar, depending where you're buying it, two dollars for the bottle. It's very inefficient cost-wise, very inefficient energy-wise. Why do we still do this? I think a, a, a major theme in my talk was I don't think there's enough public awareness here. Um, and judging by what my Facebook friends post, it's, it's obvious, too. Um, there's a lot of cli climate change deniers out there. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the right way to, to go about unwinding that is, um, but I think MIT, universities like MIT can certainly play an active role in, in doing that. And, and I just wanted to briefly mention that it's not just the Republicans, or it's not just on the right. So, the Daily Show recently did this beautiful skit where they, they uh, illustrated that science deniers on the other extreme, which is surrounding vaccines. And those vaccine deniers, if you will, tend to be more left-leaning people. So there's a lot of science denial out there in the general public. And, and the fact that it exists tells me that universities are not doing a good enough job in disseminating knowledge. So I view my role, the role of geobiologists and astrobiologists. We clearly don't solve problems of water, but we are educators. We get kids, we show them rocks, and they get excited about science. And what I do see is that, for example, the MIT news people do a fantastic job of publicizing and explaining the science we do. But it starts a lot earlier. So I think we need to reach out to really Obviously, it's a very complex problem, but we need to reach to kids that are a lot younger to show them, for example, in earth sciences, how it works and to appreciate the complex complexities of the system way earlier. 
because I get kids from high school who visit my lab and they don't even understand what geology does or is or even the basic chemistry behind it. And I think there's a lot that can be done to convey that. Thank you. So as you're no doubt aware, my profession has tried very, very hard for many decades to communicate what we know about climate science in all kinds of ways. For example, the IPCC process. And I'll leave it to you to judge the success of those efforts. But my own personal motive here is to recognize that the most important people we have to communicate to now are young people, especially young people who might solve these problems, namely our students. So the most important thing I think I can do and some of my colleagues can do is to educate MIT students about climate. Right now, only a few percent of MIT undergraduate students are ever exposed to any course in earth sciences, let alone climate. And I'd like to see that change. Uh, I've been a little bit frustrated, to be honest with you, about that. So I went off and created our department's first MIT X course. And it was on climate science, not politics, not economics, I'm afraid to say, but just the science of it. You have to start somewhere. We had about 12,000 enrollees. And uh, that's a start. I guess I'll, I'll, finish off, I'll finish off by seconding what Kerry said, that you know climate science is really tricky. It's because the math and physics is complicated. You know how we all hear about E equals MC squared? Like, even in a cartoon fashion, F equals MA. But that equation that connects the record of warming that we see and the rise of greenhouse gases, it's unknown to pretty much everybody on the planet, including all the MIT students. And so some education, like with the physics that connects the two, actually could go a long way in disseminating it among people who are just really told to believe the correlation. So I would vote for that. And I would like to finish seconding what Tanya said. You would, I mean, you know, everyone who has experience with children today, you know they love dinosaurs. And they go through a phase where they love space. And it's just unbelievable the, the excitement that kids get on this. And we need to maintain a level of excitement in any science so we can keep our pool of educated public and the people who will go on to solve the technological problems needed to solve climate change and other issues. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. Specific question for Tanya. And you talked about the green slime and how it produced gas, which is probably oxygen. Um, so the question from the, from the audience is, what is the percentage of um, oxygen today that is made by green slime? <laughs> Actually, this is, this is uh, an, again, another question that relates to biogenic signatures. On today's Earth, most of the oxygen that ends up in the atmosphere really is produced on land. So it's the terrestrial biota that contributes to that. Because everything that is produced by green slime in the oceans, and there's a ton of it, so 70% of the Earth is the ocean, a lot of that oxygen gets respired right away. And so we don't end up emitting it to the atmosphere the same way, although it's made. So the, there are equal amounts of oxygen being produced on land and in the ocean, but a lot of the oxygen in the ocean is consumed right away. Thank you. And the oceans are green slime, still. So green slime <laughs> rules. <laughs> <laughs> so we need more of that, green slime. <laughs> um, one issue about carbon that, and, and climate change and greenhouse gases that, that we've not discussed and not heard about this morning, uh, that used to be a hot topic a couple of years ago, is about carbon sequestration. And there's the science of it, there's the economics of it. Um, and I would first give the opportunity to Chris because there's a lot of economy and policy behind this. So what, what about carbon sequestration? Where, where, where do we stand? <coughs> Well, at least in the electricity industry, carbon capture and sequestration is an active uh, research area. Um, so I, uh, th there's a lot of, certainly a lot of uh, effort is, is, is in sequestration. The, the policy prescriptions are going to be pretty similar in the sense that if you had a carbon tax that power plants had to pay, they would have more of an incentive to try to sequester that carbon in, in the ground. One thing that's a little bit different with carbon sequestration and as it relates to China is, is, is notice when I talked about innovation, 
I was talking about innovation that China would want to unilaterally adopt. You know, again, imagine a world with, with, with free batteries, then China would be driving electric vehicles. Even, even if we make carbon capture sequestration and power plants pretty cheap, it's, it's always going to be costly for China to do that. Um, so that's actually an innovation that wouldn't have this sort of spillover to the developing world like innovations in that, that reduce uh, the cost of low carbon technologies below high carbon technologies. Um, so that, I don't know what that necessarily means for the optimal policy mix, but, but it, it does suggest um, other, other innovations that might, might be more effective in spilling over to, to developing countries. Something to add? Okay, then um, with my eye on the clock, uh, to go to the last question. Um, and that again is a question for each and every one of you. And so we have a fantastic audience uh, of alumni here uh, with a lot of interest in the topic, obviously, otherwise they wouldn't be here. Um, and they would like to hear from each of you uh, what they can do to give their children, our children, and the future generations a fighting chance for water, for climate. So how can the audience help? Here, Chris. <laughs> well, I, I get angry. <laughs> I think that's really, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> In addition to being angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think, I think having some influence on policy. I, I think, look, we each individually can have a pretty small, you know, an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. But the, the real impact is going to come from large-scale policies that incentivize those reductions from everyone. Um, and I think, I think influencing policymakers is, is the way to go here. When I think about uh, water supply and the, the various problems, uh, the, the issues are, are, are different regionally, as I, I mentioned before. Uh, a lot of the growth in world population is going to be occurring in places like Africa and Asia. And that's where the real pressures are going to be felt most acutely and most early. Things we can do to help those regions of the world address their problems, their needs for water, their need for food, and to stabilize the situation there will help us with our own security. In a sense, we're a rich nation. We can go out and we can buy a desalination plant. We can buy water supplies as we need them. We can import food. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. If you're a subsistence farmer in Somalia, you get an extreme weather event, your crop is wiped out, you have nothing to fall back on, and your family will starve. So the problems are much more acute uh, and perhaps more urgent in some of these other parts of the world. And we, as the people who have the capacity to help these areas, should get involved and do something. Hmm? I have a very general answer, and, and that is to stay curious. I think the reason that all of us are working on the problems that we describe today is because we're fundamentally curious about some aspect of that problem. And I think one of the best things we can do, especially to encourage future generations to help uh, learn enough to solve these problems and to work on them themselves, is to keep them curious too. So in the earth sciences in particular, that's relevant advice. Don't be content and make sure that your children and your grandchildren are not content just to look at a place in Google Earth. It's fantastic, but go there. Understand your environment, both in your backyard and elsewhere. Travel, see different parts of the Earth in terms of the natural landscape and also the human landscape. Because if we can't understand that and we don't observe it, then I think a lot of that curiosity that drives us could be lost. I'll continue the line of education, 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 both in science and in civics. So what, to relate to what Chris said, we have to be vocal and we have to be able to defend our opinions. And I think science has this enormous role in 
modern society. So I think we should educate our kids, other people's children, to really use that instead of just passively sit and say, well, yeah, it's changing. And also to be more empathetic in understanding, going back to the curiosity, understanding that what we do here impacts someone in Somalia or somewhere else. So be citizens of the world, not just this place. Okay. Well, I'd like to start off by offering a variation on a theme by Chris, which is that it's really important that young people get angry and more broadly involved in the problem. And I've already said that I think my job as an educator is to teach them what they really ought to know about the physical world that they're going to have to deal with and how to deal with it from a scientific standpoint. But our students are special because after they learn something, they want, really want to act on it. And that action can take many forms. It can take the form of protests, like this group here you may have heard about called Fossil Free MIT, which wants MIT to divest from fossil fuels. Um, they want to express that anger, but not just in protest. Um, they want to go off and do things like found companies that develop cleaner, uh, more efficient energy uh, that attack water problems. And that's where I think you all can help them, right? That you can help them transfer what they learn here at MIT into real world applications. You're proven that you're very important for that process. And I think that's the way it should work. I'll use, a lo I'll use a local example of how, I'm sure this has happened to many of you here, but we had a very cold winter here in the Boston area. <laughs> And you'll go out with friends and peers who are non-academics, and they'll go, well, here's the best example that there is no warming because we've had a bitter winter. So as MIT alums, you all have a voice, a very powerful one, among your family, friends, peers, companies, and beyond. And so I will ask you to just maintain and gain the knowledge of the science behind the story and to communicate that to your peers whenever they appear not to understand it. And even though I'm not a panelist, um, I, I take this opportunity to answer this question also. <laughs> uh, because there's many ways, of course, to, um, to help. Um, we, we've heard a lot about you know, the research that's going on, a fraction of the research that's going on in, in our department, EAPS, related to Earth and the future of Earth and understanding these systems. Uh, we've heard that MIT has launched um, a new initiative for the environment. And it has created a new laboratory under the directorship of John Leonard for uh, water food uh, security. Um, there's many ways, of course, for you to, to be involved in that and to be engaged and to, to support in, in, in a very, very active way. And if you have questions about it, I would be very happy to, uh, to answer them you know, offline. Uh, I think the most important thing you can do is to remain engaged with us and to, to follow what we do um, through events like this, but also online. Um, MIT is getting very good in, you know, distributing um, news items and, you know, it's very easy to follow with social media, et cetera, et cetera. And I really encourage you to, uh, to stay connected to MIT and in particular, you know, on the topics of today. So that's what, what you can all do. And with those remarks, um, you know, we are getting to the close, almost only five minutes too late. So it's not too bad. And I thank you very, very much for your attention. Um, Both of, course, both, of course, you in the audience, but also uh, on, on the remote links. And of course, in particular, I would like to thank the six speakers of, of today. Thank you very much. And just let me finish with a practical announcement um, that those attending the Tech Day lunch should proceed to the Johnson Athletic Center. And those attending the luncheon for the graduate alumni should proceed to Massey Hall. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Alumni Association, I just wanted to thank you, Rob, for uh, moderating this panel and to all of our panelists for their contributions today. Thank you very much. Thank you.